When I started, I thought one man was in trouble and three were trying to help him. But after I found two pounds of tobacco, two pieces of brass, and a boat without a pilot heading straight out to sea, I knew they had all been in trouble, and all had taken the hard way out. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Hard Way Out. I had killed a shank of the afternoon in a Hollywood department store, trying for the fifth consecutive year to select something unique in a personalized Christmas card. A bright-eyed sales girl finally suggested in desperation a smoking 38, spelling out Noel in delicate wisps of white curling smoke. Well, I gave up, settled for a reissue of last year's unoriginal message. An hour later, I was driving out towards Sepulveda and my new client, August Quigg, and I was glad to be away from the pre-holiday crowds and back to work. When I pulled up in front of the factory building, a, an immodest sign told me the man I was to meet inside was president and co-founder of Quig and Slater, manufacturers of nothing but the best in construction materials. Come in, come in. Be with you in a minute. I'm on the phone. Listen, August Quig does not change his policy overnight, Slater. Not after 25 years. You should know that, you of all people. Never mind the excuses, Slater. Those you always have, and they make me sick. Partnership trouble, Mr. Quigg? Mm. Oh, no, my partner is dead now ten years. That was his son, Keith Slater. But he has nothing to say here. His father left it that way. Well, sit down, Mr. Marlowe, please. Slater is not what I want to talk to you about. All right, Mr. Quigg, who is the man, and what's his problem? My general manager, Frank Emery. No? Oh. He has embezzled $60,000 of this company's money in the last year. Hmm. Then isn't this a great time for you to climb the nearest rooftop and scream copper? No, because I want to save Frank Emery, not condemn him. Why? What's so special about a general manager who keeps dipping itchy fingers into the till? Mr. Marlowe, Frank Emery has worked for me for seven years. And in that time, he has climbed from shop worker to plant foreman to general manager. And that is something which took me 15 years. Which proves what? That Frank can one day go right to the top. Here, to my job. The honest way. And that is just the path he was on until a year ago when he got married. Oh. Then he started to fill his pockets with company lettuce before he'd even gotten rid of the rice, is that it? Yes. But don't leap to any conclusions, Mr. Marlowe, because his wife, Sheila, is a very sweet woman. Everybody knows that. And if anything, she should be a good influence. Mm -hmm. Mr. Quigg, what's Frank Emery's salary? 175 a week. Oh. When'd you last see him? This afternoon, about 2 o'clock. I called him in here. But I didn't say anything about the shortage. We just talked. I asked him if he thought he needed a vacation. But he only sulked. He said he'd be all right in a little while. Then he left. But when he got back to his desk, he only stopped there long enough to pick up his hat. That was three hours ago. You've called his house since? Uh, twice, but I got no answer. Here's the number, Marlowe, and the address. Mm -hmm. Now we better stop talking, start moving. I must know what Frank Emery plans to do. Yeah, this is my private number. Oh. The plant will close in half an hour, but I'll be here working late. Okay. But before I get going, Mr. Quigg, one more question. Mm? Just so all this will make some sense to me. Were you ever in a jam like this yourself? A long time ago, maybe? And you know what it's like to be in Emory's shoes? Hmm. You're a pretty alert fellow, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> I do seem to remember a rich man who once kept me out of a lot of trouble. But the details aren't very clear anymore, so... Good night and good luck. Hello? Mr. Frank Emery, please. I'm sorry, he's not in. Is this Philip Marlowe? Yeah, that's right. That should make you Sheila Emery, huh? Yes, I just finished speaking to August Quigg at the plant, Mr. Marlowe. He told me about you. And about Frank. Take it easy, Mrs. Emery. Crying isn't going to help Frank any. Yes, I know. But how can I help, Frank? What can I do? I'm not sure. But look, can you meet me right away? I'm at the Golden Crown. It's a cocktail lounge on Santa Monica Boulevard near Bradley. Yes, of course, Mr. Marlowe. I'll be there as soon as possible. A 
exactly 34 minutes later, a two-tone, sleek convertible about the size of a Pullman car glided to a stop in front of the Golden Crown. The loveliness behind the wheel was wearing a hundred-dollar hand-knit dress that just wouldn't let go. I knew it couldn't be Sheila Emery, but it was. She was a tall, luscious blonde with blue-gray eyes that were set wide apart in a face that any angel would have gladly traded his wings for. Now, five minutes later, we were seated inside at a quiet corner booth. But only two weeks ago, everything was perfect, Mr. Marlowe. Frank didn't seem to have a care in the world. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, he changed. He became quiet, almost morose. You never suspected that he was stealing from Quaid? Of course not. And I still think there's some explanation, something we don't know about. Maybe. But from where I sit, it looks like you two have been keeping up with the Vanderbilts instead of the Joneses. It always dents the bank account. Just what do you mean by that, Mr. Marlowe? Exhibit A, that knit one pearl two number you're wearing. What? Exhibit B, that splash of automobile you drove up in. But Frank said we could afford those things. I know because I was worried when we bought the boat. Yeah, what boat? The Carefree. It's a 30-foot sailboat. We dock it near our cottage just beyond Santa Monica. Hey, wait a minute. A sailboat, a cottage at the beach, that car? Just how far do you think 175 bucks will stretch these days? What do you mean? Frank makes twice that, plus bonuses. Not unless he has a very fancy paper route on the side. Because 175, period, is the figure that Quig quoted to me an hour ago. Oh, no. No, I can't believe that. Frank wouldn't lie to me that way. Yeah, some guys do funny things when they're too much in love. Oh, now, look, tears take time, honey. How about holding him back long enough to give me some dope that'll put me on Frank's trail, huh? I mean, names and numbers, his clubs, his friends, anything that'll give me a line. Yes, of course. But all that information is, is, in, is in his address book at home. All right. Home's our next stop. Uh, just between us, Sheila. What are the chances that Frank has an extracurricular interest on a back street somewhere? Another woman? Oh, no, I'm sure that's not the way things are. Frank loves me very much. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Believe me, if he doesn't, we're not looking for an embezzler. We're after a maniac. Come on, let's get out of here. When we left the Golden Crown, Sheila was still crying and in no shape to drive. So after parking my coupe in a nearby lot, we floated out to the Emory Place in Brentwood in her two-tone Nash, which did everything at the push of a button except dry a girl's tears. At her house, Sheila pulled herself together long enough to give me a handful of addresses that might possibly lead to Frank Emery. But just as I was about to leave, I, I noticed a single phone number scribbled in pencil on the edge of a desk blotter. It was Crenshaw 22131. And since Sheila couldn't explain it, I wrote it down on a slip of paper and filed it in my pocket and left. But once outside, I remembered that my car was still on Santa Monica Boulevard at the Golden Crown. So I started back to the house to call a cab. I stopped suddenly at the sound of somebody in the shadows alongside the house. When I moved toward the noise, a man darted out between two trees, and I went after him. Get your hands off of Why, so we can play another round of hide-and-seek? No dice, brother. I'm getting too old for it. Now, who are you? What are you doing around the Emory place? Come on, let's have it. Say, wait a minute, aren't you... Aren't you Marlowe? The man August Quig hired? That's right. But you still haven't answered my question. Oh, no, but I will now that I know who you are. I'm Quiz Keith Slater. Surely dear Quig must have told you of me, the wastrel son of his late partner. He did, but you're still parrying, Slater. Why were you hiding behind those trees? Correction, Marlowe, I wasn't hiding. I was waiting for Frank Emery. All right, we won't argue terms. Why were you waiting? Because I want to get hold of Emery and help him before he goes too far. You see, Marlowe, he came back to the office after you left. What? Did he talk to Quig? No, the place had just closed and the old man was out for dinner. Did you talk to Emery? Yes, and it wasn't much fun. That poor fellow's just about out of his mind, Marlowe. Hmm. Well, he raved on for an hour and a half about how unfair Quig was. Said he knew that I was the one who'd get to run Quig and Slater after the old man died. I don't follow that. When did you become the fair-haired boy around there? Oh, I'm hardly that. But I do own a quarter of the plant, unless, of course, Quig fires me one day. Those are the terms of my father's will. But Quig won't fire you, is that it? He wouldn't think of it. After all, that would keep my dear father from resting easy in his grave. Okay, okay, let's skip it. Exactly what did Frank Emery tell you, Slater? He said that August Quigg was a two-faced liar and that he'd settle with him in his own way. I told Quigg that when he got back from dinner. 
And I also reminded him that Frank had a key to the office. That didn't face Quig, did it? No, he said he never worries twice. If Emery walked in on him, he'd think about what to do about it then. I tell you, Marlowe, we've got to get hold of Frank Emery and stop him before it's too late. <laughs> In just a moment, back to the adventures of Philip Barlow. But first, just one hour from now, over most of these same CBS network stations, Eve Arden will be midway through her regular Sunday night role of Our Miss Brooks, America's most charming and most highly unusual school teacher. You've seen Eve Arden make her hilarious way through many a Hollywood movie. Now you can hear her every Sunday night as Our Miss Brooks, just a little later, over most of these same CBS network stations. And now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Hard Way Out. It was nearly an hour later before I was back in my office on Cahuenga with my finger in the dial of the telephone checking the names and places that Sheila Emery had given me. Two nightclubs, three hotels, and five friends later, I'd run through the list without a single kosher lead. Sitting there thinking of all the places a guy could disappear to, I I reached into my pocket for a lifesaver and found something else. The slip of paper that read Crenshaw 22131. The number I'd seen on the desk blotter at Emery's place. So, with nothing more to lose than another millimeter off the tip of my index finger, I went back to dialing. Sam Newton talking. Newton's what? Pipe and tobacco shop. What can I do for you? <laughs> Not a thing, old timer. My mistake. Pipe and tobacco shop. Marlowe speaking. This is Sheila Emery, Marlowe. I think I know where Frank is. You do? Yes, at our cottage at the beach. It's closed up, but I was just going through some things in my desk when I discovered that the keys to the place were gone. And I clearly remember seeing them only yesterday. What's the exact location of that cottage? It's two miles north of Santa Monica and down on the beach, directly behind a large white frame house on the Pacific Coast Highway. Number 1221. You can't miss it. 1221. Okay, I'm leaving right now, and I'll call you as soon as I can, so try not to worry. Somehow or other, I made it straight out along Sunset to the beach and then north as far as the large white frame house without being tagged for low flying by any of the boys in blue. But when I got down to the cottage on the beach, I found it deserted and boarded up like opening night at an unlicensed peep show in Boston. Except for a couple of stray gulls who probably had insomnia, I was all alone. But the gregarious streak in me didn't suffer very long because a minute later, I had an unannounced visitor was a nasty caliber 45 automatic. And the man on the other end who gripped the handle like he knew what he was doing was none other than the general manager of Quig and Slater, Mr. Frank Emery. You mind telling me who you are and what you want here? Well, the name, which probably doesn't matter, Mr. Emery, is Philip Marlowe. But my business with you is something else. I'm working for your boss, August Quig, and believe it or not, he wants to help That's you. That's a lie, Marlowe. Nobody wants to help me, and you know that. This is a smart trick, but it won't work. It can't work. And I'll tell you why. When the police do get to me, Marlowe, they won't find anything but a corpse. Is that clear? Suicide. Don't be a fool. What about your wife? Marlowe, that's why I took the 60,000 bucks. So save your breath. Unless you're interested in joining me, do exactly as I say. Now, here. Pick up these keys and open that door. Go on. Now, throw the keys back gently. Please, Emery, listen to me. No. I've listened to too many people already. Now it's my turn to talk. But all I'm going to say is goodbye in my own way. You don't know what you're doing, Emery. Stop a minute. Think. This isn't the time to think, Marlowe. This is the time to act. Now, get in. Emery backed me into the cottage, stepped outside, and pulled the door shut. I waited a moment until I heard his car start. Then I tried the door and knew I was wasting my time. Emery had run a piece of pipe through the handle, and Gargantua himself couldn't have opened it from the inside. It took me ten minutes to kick enough boards off one of the windows to wiggle out and another five to get to a phone. When I told Sheila that her husband was on her way home in a very desperate frame of mind, she promised to hold him at all costs until I could get there. Twenty minutes later, I was in Sheila's house on Bundy Drive. Marlowe, what happened? Where's your husband? I don't know. He hasn't been here. Oh, fine. After you called me, I waited, but he didn't come back. Marlowe, what did you mean when you said Frank was desperate? I'm afraid Frank intends to kill himself. Kill himself? 
Oh, no, he can't. Now, we still may be able to stop him. When he left the beach house, he was heading someplace to say goodbye. I figured for sure that meant you, but wherever he was going, he didn't want to be followed. He locked me in and... The gun. Holy smoke, where's your phone? Right over there. Oh. Uh, what about a gun? Does Frank have one? Yeah, yeah, 45. He didn't come here to make his last goodbyes. That only leaves all this quick. Do you know what you're saying? Come on, come on, answer that phone. Yeah. No answer on Quigg's private wire. You're accusing Frank of murder. He hates Mr. Quigg, yes, but I know he couldn't kill him. He couldn't. Now, you listen to me. Your husband's cornered, and he's decided to blast his way out of a hopeless situation. I'm going to Quigg's office. If Frank comes back, try to keep him here. But don't try too hard, because it might be dangerous now, even for you. Drove down Sepulveda to the black, hulking plant of Quigg and Slater, pulled over, parked, and walked up the alley toward the side entrance. Through a barred window, I saw the feeble nightlight that glowed in the outer office. Otherwise, the place was dark. When I got to the door, I stopped. A diamond-shaped key stuck out of the lock, and the heavy door was ajar. I eased it open and listened. Nothing. I pulled the key out of the lock and dropped it in my pocket. Then I went inside and switched on the lights. Oh, I found him on the floor next to the desk in his private office. He'd been shot in the chest point blank with a forty-five, which meant that even before he fell, August Quigg was dead. The room was untouched. Quigg's key case lay in the pencil tray on his desk. I snapped it open and saw what I expected. His diamond-shaped key. I switched off the lights and started out. When I heard heels clicking up the hallway... I backed up against the wall and waited. It was Keith Slater. He hesitated in the open door, a startled look on his face. Good Lord. Quick. Hello, Slater. Who is it? Marlowe. I wouldn't touch anything if I were you. The police will want to see it just as it is. Marlowe, he's been murdered. I had no idea Frank would go this far. Yeah, he's full of surprises tonight. Are you sure he's not carrying any grudges against you? Frank and I are old friends. That old man in there was different. He wasn't human. He was a machine, a rock crusher with a concrete heart. I'm only sorry it was Frank who did that to him because he'll never be able to get away with it. He doesn't intend to. Plans to commit suicide any minute now. Tell me something straight, Slater. How does he feel about his wife? Is he jealous? Jealous? Why, I... Marlo, you don't think that he might kill Sheila? I'm going to call her right away. Wait a minute. If Frank is there, a phone call would only hurry things. Come on, let's go. <laughs> like the looks of this, Marlo. Neither do I. Sheila? Frank? Anybody home? They're not here. Neither one of them. Well, if they are, they're not talking. Oh, you've got a macabre sense of humor. Nobody's laughing, brother. Look, you check upstairs. I'll see what I can find down here. For once, I hope it's nothing. I gave the ground floor a fast run-through. It was neat and tidy, from copper-potted ivy on the dining room wall to the sunbeam toastmaster on the breakfast tray. The only thing out of place was a bottle of scotch near the kitchen sink and lipstick on the glass beside it said Sheila. I was back in the living room before I found out why she had needed that bracer. Propped against a bowl of violets on the coffee table were two notes pinned together. The top one was for me, from Sheila. It said, Marlo, I just found this note from Frank. I'm sure he means that he's going out in our boat the carefree. I've got to stop him, Sheila. I turned to Frank's note and was reading it as Slater came down the stairs. Nothing unusual upstairs, Marlo. Did you... What's that? What have you found? Frank's suicide note. He asked Sheila to forgive him and forget him. Here, read it yourself. I'm going to call the police. Sure means that he's going out in our boat to care for you. Say! Wrong. I, I thought you were going to call the police. I was. But I noticed this phone number here on the desk blotter again. It's a tobacco dealer. Slater, I've got a very wacky idea. I'm going to give it a try. Newton Tobacco Shop? Yes, but we're closed. It's after midnight, you know. Yeah, I know. This is the police, Mr. Newton. We want some information. Police? What, 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 what did you want? It? Take it easy. Do you have a customer named Emery, Frank Emery? Yes. He was in late this afternoon. What did he buy? Tobacco. A special blend I make up for him. I see. How much of it did he get? Oh, my. Let me think now. Two pounds. Yes, that's right. Two pounds. I'm sure of it. 
Man could lay quite a smoke screen with two pounds of tobacco, couldn't he? Thanks, Mr. Newton. You've been a big help. What's the matter, Slater? You look troubled. Are you thinking the same thing I am? I don't know what you're thinking, Milo. This. It's mighty weird for a guy who's planning suicide to go buy himself two pounds of tobacco a few hours before he blows his brains out. Put it succinctly, pal, I'm thinking that Frank Emery's suicide's a big, fat phony. This is Lieutenant Ibarra. Malo Ibarra. Catching you at this hour is the best break I've had all night. How so? What's up, Marlo? Guy's been murdered, and his killer, one Frank Emery, is getting away by boat. Can you sell the harbor patrol on running him down for me? It's his own, a sailboat called the Carefree. A 30-footer with an auxiliary motor. He'll be out of ways, off to Panga Canyon. Well, that can be arranged, but where will I find you? I'll need some particulars. I'm going to his beach place. It's in a little cove two miles above Santa Monica. There's a pier and a boathouse a couple of hundred yards beyond. Okay, Marla, we'll find it. Now listen, don't get your feet wet. Wait till we get there. The Emery Beach House was deserted and dark. So Slater and I went on to the boathouse, which was dark, too. That's where we found Sheila, lying on the planks, sobbing out the end of a long, hard cry. Slater ran to her and lifted her to her feet. Oh, Sheila. Sheila, what happened? Where's Frank? Oh, Keith. I was too late. I saw him leave. He waved to me and called goodbye. I begged him to come back, but no, he never will. Don't be too sure of that, honey. What do you mean, Marlo? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That boat coming in is probably Ibarra. Yeah, here, Ibarra. I got another boat out looking for the Capri, Marlow, so I came directly here. Uh, who's this? Uh, Mrs. Emery, Mr. Slater, Lieutenant Ibarra. How do you do? Lieutenant. Well, Marlow, what's it all about? Well, an embezzler killed his boss, set up a strong case of suicide, and at the moment is pulling a very fast switch. Well, you mean he's not really checking out? How do you figure? He bought two pounds of his favorite pipe tobacco today. What's that? Wait, Sheila. Well, that's interesting, Phil, but suicide's a peculiar people. Okay, but I'll bet you my sea scout insignia against a dead jellyfish that he's got a small boat aboard and that he's going to get off the carefree and row to shore. How about it, Mrs. Emery? Is there a small boat? There's a rubber life raft in one of the lockers. That'll do it. It's all he needs. Senator Barra. Yes, Mooney, what is it? We just got a call on the radio from the other boat. They've spotted the carefree running without light southwest about two and a half miles offshore. He's holding a steady course, but there's nobody at the wheel. Bag seems to be abandoned. Well, tell him to stand by, but leave her alone. We'll be right out. Well, Marla, we'll know in a minute. Let's go, folks. Get aboard. A harbor patrol cutter sliced through the black swells with the easy grace of a head waiter after a $10 tip. And all the way out, it looked as though Marla was going to be the bright boy of the evening. When we pulled alongside the carefree, we made her fast and boarded her. It still looked that way. It looked great. Right up to the point when Ibarra peered through the porthole in the closed cabin, jerked the door open and went inside. (laughs) After that, it didn't look so good. Marlo, come in here. Is this Frank Emery? Yeah. Yeah, that's him, Ibarra. He's been shot over the heart from up close with a forty-five. Undoubtedly, the one he still has gripped in his hand there. Lieutenant Ibarra, is it Frank? Yeah, you better not come in, Mrs. Emery. Your husband has killed himself. I walked back to the stern and sat down. Ibarra was going through his grim routine inside, and I felt lousy. I stared down vacantly at my feet and only gradually became aware of the little brass cylinder that danced across the deck with every roll of the boat. I picked it up. It was an ejected cartridge from a forty-five. I'd found an empty forty-five cartridge. All at once, things began to take shape for me. Ibarra! Ibarra, hold everything! I was right. Emery didn't commit suicide after all. Phil, the man's body's right here, the gun in his hand. I know, I know, but he was murdered. Now, look, I found this out on deck, and the door to this cabin was closed, do you remember? When a man is shot with a forty-five, he drops. He doesn't walk in, close the door, and then fall. Well, that's... Did Emery have any keys on him? Yes, these are his. They're in the ignition by the wheel. Sure, sure. Look, look, this diamond-shaped one. It matches one I've got in my pocket. Come on out on deck, Ibarra, and watch closely. Hey, Slater! Slater, can I see your key to the side door of the factory? Why, certainly, Milo. It's right here in my pocket. Hey, it's not in your pocket because it's here in my hand, Slater. You were so excited when you shot Quig, you ran off and left it sticking in the lock. No! And here's one for you, Mrs. Emery. While the carefree was still tied up at the dock, you stood right here, surprised your husband in the cabin door, and shot him. 
This little cartridge was ejected back to the stern. But you forgot about that, because after you shoved him inside and put the gun in his hand, you closed the door. Then you started the motor, locked the wheel, and cut the boat loose. I don't know what you're talking Look about. Look out, Ibarra! Ibarra's after your gun! Ah, that was nice, Ibarra. Marlo, I wouldn't have believed this. Don't lose your place, because you'll have to go over it all again. Don't worry, I won't. You see, it's sort of like an equation. Two pounds of tobacco and two pieces of brass added up to two bodies and two murderers. Well, Marlowe, it beats me that Mrs. Emery seemed to be nothing but sweet, soft, and stay-at-home nights. Yeah. And yet she pulled one of the richest double crosses on record. Ibarra, she let her husband steal a fortune for her and even helped him plan a fake suicide to get away. <laughs> then she turned around and used this plan, only no fake this time, to kill him. So she'd be free to marry Slater. But she didn't want Slater without the money, right? Right. And as long as August Quigg lived, Slater could never be sure of his income. So Slater killed him, and they hung that on Frank Emery, too. Mm-hmm. And they worked a fast routine of past the detective right through the middle of it all. <laughs> While Slater killed Quigg, I was with Sheila. Then Slater took me over while she killed Frank. They make a great team in a shell game, Wallow. Yeah. <laughs> but you did all right. Well, see you tomorrow, the report, you know. Good night, Phil. I sat alone on the pier for a long time. I watched the waves come in, and gradually my mind got untangled from the treachery and violence it had been wrapped up in all night. And the lady turned out to be the tiger. And then as my thoughts plowed back through the whole mess of the afternoon when I'd been shopping for Christmas cards, I made up my mind to cancel my order and have an entirely new set printed up. They say it pays to advertise, and if that's true, right across the top of my new cards in big block letters, I'm going to have the words, Goodwill Toward Men. Who knows? Maybe it'll help. Anyway, I hope so. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in tonight's cast were Barbara Fuller, Louis Van Ruten, Bill Daly, and Edgar Barrier. Lieutenant Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I walked into it smiling because it had all the corny elements. The weird doctor, the beautiful girl... The gloomy house on the windswept cliff. Even the hulking menace. Only one thing was missing. The body. And that's when I stopped smiling. Because I turned out to be the corpse myself. Almost. Listen later tonight and every Sunday night to John Dixon Carr's newest mysteries on the CBS series Cabin B-13 over most of these same CBS network stations. And now stay tuned for The Electric Theater starring Miss Helen Hayes in Angel Street, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>